That was a big interruption. Anyway, Sutra and Tantra, essence of Sutra, essence of Tantra. So I'll just start. Uh, first, we generate a vast motivation that we're here. By what we hear, think about, what we reflect on, what we discuss, may it serve as a cause for our awakening. So only when we are awake, we'll be able to benefit all sentient beings. Only when we are more awake, will we be able to benefit, better benefit all sentient beings, including ourselves. Sangye chodam soki chonam ha changchu bardu dagni chap suchi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki dola penchir sangye dupa sho sangye chodam soki chonam ha changchu bardu dagni chap suchi dagi jin soki pe sonam ki dola penchir sangye dupa sho. Okay, there's multiple purposes for this. A lot of people mix up. A lot of people think that Vajrayana Tantra is a different yana from the Mahayana. This is a common thing. <laughs> you know? uh, I, before I was involved, for many, many years before I did a Nundro in the Kargyu tradition, and they often tended to say, you know, we follow the Vajrayana, which is superior to the Mahayana. It is the Mahayana. It's just a different branch of the Mahayana. So it's to kind of straighten that out a little bit. And it has a history, this, as I, will, as I will tell you now. First, let's go back. Buddhism was brought to Tibet in the seventh century, right? By Padmasambhav. Padmasambhav brought the tantras. He was the, he was the consummate yogi, tantric yogi. But the sutra at that time was brought by Shantarakshita, same time. He brought the sutra lineages. They came at the same time to Sanya, et cetera. And then there was a dark period uh, under the King Long Dharma when things kind of fell apart in Tibet. They were persecuted. Buddhism in general was persecuted because the, the uh, emperor, if there was an emperor of Tibet, uh, the king, uh, they got his ear. The Bonpos again wanted to reestablish Bonpo. They felt the Bun religion. They felt threatened by the Buddhists. And so there was a persecution of Buddhism, big time. And at the same time in China, it was the later Tang dynasty. The Tang dynasty was like probably the greatest flowering of culture in the history of this planet. But at that time, there was a great persecution of Buddhism because the Confucians and the Taoists got the ear of the emperor and, and Buddhism was always considered a foreign religion, a foreign religion <laughs> because it comes from India, you know? And the same happened in these times during in India. They don't like to admit that, uh, that Hinduism, the actual Vedas came from what's now Kazakhstan. It all had to be indigenous to India. But in fact, it came from another area, the Aryans. So there got to be a confusion in that sense. So anyway, there was a bit, there was a degeneration and then things got pretty bad. And in, in, in Toling, the king of Toling, King Yeshi E, you probably heard of him. He, he wanted to bring, because of what was going on in the degeneration, he wanted to bring the greatest guru in all of India to come to Tibet and kind of purify things, kind of straighten things out. So King Yeshiru, uh, he was kidnapped and they, and they wanted a big ransom for him. They want a huge amount of money. And King Yeshi said, don't give, he said, let them kill me. Take the money, take the gold. Don't give it to these killers. And you go to India and you bring back the greatest guru in India. So they went and they connected the greatest guru in India was the great Atisha. Wasn't he the great Atisha, a lord from Bengal? And um, and so it's interesting. Um, Atisha's guru was Serlingpa. He made the famous thirteen-month journey to Indonesia, which is the greatest flowering of Dharma. 
Atisha had, I think, 157 gurus, you know, but the number one guru he had was Serlingpa, who taught him Bodhicitta, who taught him the, the essence of the Dharma. And so um, he got that from Indonesia. It was like a 13 months in a boat, but he was back in India. And then he was requested by these wild Tibetans to come back to Tibet and teach and all this gold was offered. And he had some doubts about going to Tibet. But it's interesting because my, my speciality has been kind of serious tar retreats. And in Bodh Gaya as a place where I was giving them for many, many, many years. And there in Bodh Gaya, near the Bodh Gaya stupa is where Atisha made prayers about what he should do. And Tara appeared to him and said, yeah, it's, it's good to go to Tibet. It's wonderful to bring to, if you can go to Tibet, but your life will be shortened by the, by the journey and your age and everything. So he went to Tibet. So when he got to Toling, everything was totally degenerate in Tibet. Varjayana and Sutta, Buddhism and Varjayana Tantra were two different religions. They were all practicing the Tantrics were practicing the Tantra. And it was, there wasn't very much pure Mayana Buddhism happening there. Things got a bit mixed up and he was like aghast. He comes this purest of all beings and he brought the purity to the Dharma. He came there and so he introduced absolutely pure Dharma and kind of cleaned things up a bit. What he did is he he introduced the, the his, his tradition was the Kadampa tradition, not to be mixed up with the new Kadampa tradition that comes out of England that took over the Manjushri Institute from my guru. But anyway, it, it, it was actually a name later that the Galugs used, the new Kadampa, but that got co-opted by some people that we've heard of. So anyway, Atisha brought, and there were the Kadampa Geshis around him, famous ones, and from them, they're very famous for all the Lojong teachings, etc. So Atisha caught the Landrum, the, the Bodhipadipa, the, the light on the path, which is a very condensed text, from which comes all of the Lam Rims. All the different Lam Rims come from that path. I think Lama Zopa Rinpoche, he's been teaching in North Carolina for many, many years now, Jalandrum. And um, so anyway, that's the source of the Lam Rim. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not so long, but out of that, it was, it was expanded to become the Lam Rim. At that time in Tibet, of course, this is before the, before there was a Gelug sect, there was the Kadampas, there was the Sakyas and there were the Nimas and there were the Kargus and there, there the Nyingmas are the old school. Nyingma means old and Sarma, the new, new translation schools was the Sakya and um, the later the, uh, the Gelu. But anyway, um, in the Kargyu school, you had Milarepa and his, of course there's the lineage of the Kargyu school, you know, the Marpa went to Tibet and he received the lineages from, uh, from Naropa, and his main disciple was Milarepa, and Milarepa had two disciples. One, uh, one was Reshumpa, who was a yogi, you know, a, a kind of a wild yogi, and the other was Gampopa, who was a Kadampa monk, a proper monk. So from, from Gampopa came the Lamrim, and the first long Lamrim text was the Jewel Ornament of Liberation. And um, so then it was very clear about you keep Tantra, you keep it completely secret. You don't show it openly because it's really can lead to degeneration. A lot of people think it's just about sexuality, different things. Do, 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 do. So anyway, um, things were purified again, thanks to the great Atisha. If you ever go to Tibet, I went to Kailash, you can go to Toling and you can see this is Atisha's house and you can go to all these places, it's amazing. So, um, so there's really just the one vehicle of the Mahayana. And so I titled this thing, what's the, the essence of the, uh, the, the essence of the Mahayana, Sutra and Tantra? Well, the essence of the Sutra, we've already taught, even I've taught, was the, so you could say the Four Noble Truths. But, um, but the so, so Four Noble Truths per se are not even, uh, they're not even, uh, 
Mahayana, they're still the lower, they're the middle scope. Actually, it came, came, it came from that, that middle scope came, and then, and then it went to the higher scope. If we divide the Lam Rim into three parts, we have the lower scope. Here I have a copy of the Lam Rim that I use when I'm teaching to do a little quick review. The Lam Rim prayer from the Lama Chopa. And it said, the first, the first is a holy and worshipful guru, supreme field of merit, through my offerings and devoted requests, to you protectors, root of all well-being, may you gladly care for me. And so the first is the guru. Guru is the root of the path, the root of the Lam Rim. But in some of the Dalai Lama, when he was teaching sometimes, he taught some Lam Rim texts there in Dharamsala, uh, Essence of Refined Gold, and there was a couple. And at the beginning, he said, there's a lot of Westerners, and he says, Sometimes this worshiping the guru is maybe too much for Westerners. They're going to bounce off of it. And they do a lot. You know, there's all these degenerate things about guru, you know. And uh, whoa, guru is all there. They're, they like women. They like money. Do, do, do. You know, so guru was almost a dirty word for a while in the culture. So anyway, but the main thing is, is when you read things like the Dalai Lama said, when you read the 50 verses of guru devotion by Ashva Gosa, it says things like, You'll go to hell if you step over the guru's shadow, if you step over his shoes and things like that. And that's kind of radical. And Dalai Lama even says, that's kind of radical. But for Lama Zopa, it's not radical. That's the way he practices. Bomb perfect with the guru. Not the slightest fault, you know? So there was a danger of people misunderstanding the guru. But when we get to the Tantra, as we will in this talk, you have to have a guru. It's, it's, it, you can't just... You, you can practice the sutra path, the next paths, and including the lower scope, which is you know, precious human rebirth, uh, death and impermanence, karma and its effect, etc. lower realms and taking refuge. And then when we get to the middle scope, then we're actually at the level of... Um, where we bring in liberation. The lower scope does not lead to liberation. It leads to higher rebirth. But the middle scope includes the Four Noble Truths and it includes the 12 links of dependent origination. And there, that's when we, we move to Mahayana. So the best, the basis of the, but even then the basis of the middle school, those, those, those two practices aren't Mahayana per se. So when we do those things and when we study those things, we always have Mahayana motivation. That's why it's so important, the bodhicitta motivation, whatever we do. So whether it's sutra or whether it's tantra, which are both Mahayana, we always do the Mahayana motivation and there has to be emptiness. There has to be those two limbs. Otherwise, there's no enlightenment. But the essence of the middle scope and the essence of, the, of Buddhism in general what is it that makes something Buddhist? It's the four seals, isn't it? And there's a, the four seals are that all compounded phenomena are impermanent and changing. The second one is that uh, there's nothing intrinsically existent. Everything is a relativity. And the third one is that afflicted minds lead to suffering. And the fourth is that the removal of afflictions is nirvana, is peace. So those four seals are basically encapsulized. But particularly, there has to be emptiness, shunyata, for it to be Buddhist. That's the, that's the defining character that is unique to Buddhism. If it has the four seals, particularly if it has um, emptiness, it's Buddhist. If it doesn't have it, it's not really Buddhist. There was a beautiful book. Maybe some of you have read it, How to Know If You're Not a Buddhist by Kenzie Rinpoche, Jung and Kenzie Rinpoche. It's great. It's a book just about the four seals. And he says in the book, because he likes to kind of tease a little bit everybody he, uh, he says uh, if you are taught from someone from a high throne and it isn't based on the four seals or the four noble truth it's not really buddhism but if you were taught by a surfer and he taught the four seals it would be buddhism and he says the people aren't going to like this he, he likes to make in, you know, revolutionary statements like that but it's boom you know so anyway those are the essential practices and to go into it a little more, I can remember how much I was going to, we'll have to focus mostly on the Tantra, introduction to Tantra more. So what do we have as we move into the Mahayana? 
from the middle scope to the higher scope. In the middle scope, we have the uh, rangzin, grasping at an eye, grasping at itself that never existed is the root of samsara, isn't it? What keeps us in samsara is not realizing shunyata, not realizing that everything's dependent and arising. That's the rangzin, grasping at an eye, a false eye that never existed. That's the root of, uh, of psychic existence. And until that's uprooted and that's uprooted by meditating on emptiness, which is the root of the Four Noble Truths, in order to uproot the first of the Four Noble, the, 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 the cause of suffering. First is ignorance, in order you have to realize shunyata, in order to overcome ignorance, because with ignorance comes from ignorance, all of the delusions, etc. <clears throat> As we know from the Heart Sutra, though, there's the four, I was gonna read the Heart Sutra, but we don't have enough time. Uh, I would read it if it was a longer teaching. But in the Heart Sutra, you have Avalokiteshvara, he looks down and he sees that the five skandhas are empty in their own being, doesn't he? And the five skandhas are very important. The five skandhas are form, feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and consciousnesses. So basically, the Buddha divided us into these parts. He divided us into mind, and he divided us into body. And he divided the mind into, the, into, into four parts. Actually, he divided the mind into primary consciousnesses and mental factors. But he dedicated an entire mental factor to feeling, an entire mental, uh, an entire, uh, he divided the entire mental factor to, to feeling, the skanda of feeling, entire mental factor to uh, the third is perceptions. And then all of the other 51 or 49 mental factors were lumped together in karmic formations. And then the fifth one is the consciousness is primary consciousness and regular conventional, conventional relative consciousness. So why it was so important that the Buddha did that? Because everything that appears to us, everything that appears to us, since we haven't realized shunyata, everything that appears, appears as if it's existing from its own side, doesn't it? Everything. And so on the basis of everything appearing from its own side, when things appear, feeling takes, oh, whatever appears, we think, I, I like this. The feeling, I feel good about this. I don't feel good about that, you know, or I don't care about this. So everything, we make those judgments with everything that appears to us. This is so important and fundamental in the Dharma. And this is key, key, key to the Sutra. And so then the next one is discriminations. It has many translations. So something appears to us, if it appears that it's existent from its own side, and then it appears if it's self-existent, good or bad, are indifferent. Feeling judges those three. And perceptions, of course, says, I are discriminations. I want the good. I don't want the bad. I don't care about the other. And so we go through the around and round to the cycle of so, cycle of existence, grasping attachment for the good and aversion for the bad, around and round and round we go. So the Buddha himself organized it that way. So it's so crucial. And Lama Yeshi also, Lama Yeshi was my guru I was fortunate enough to spend 10 years with. And he, uh, he says, we go through life say, saying the good, bad mantra. We got these, he pulls out his molly, he goes, we're doing the good, bad mantra, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Everything that appears, that's what we're doing, isn't it? Judge, 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 judge. And how we have to kind of let that go because we're doing it constantly. And um, so anyway, the middle scope is the uprooting to the realization of shunyata. And then, of course, we know the Four Noble Truths, the cause of suffering. The first cause is ignorance, and then, and then pride, jealousy, attachment, aversion, all comes from that. And then we, we, we act out, and the karmic imprint goes on the consciousness, and, and that comes to causes the cause of suffering, etc. And uh, so basically, in a nutshell, that's sort of the sutra teachings, but there's a lot more things to it than that, you could say. 
So our job, as we know, is we have to generate bodhicitta. First, the aspiring. We have to, you know, sincerely that we want to awaken for the benefit of all beings so that it's Mahayana Buddhism. And everything that we do has to be combined with emptiness. It shouldn't be like some separate category. So what I'm going to read to you now is uh, for us to become awakened. To us to become finally awakened, we have to realize shunyata. And for us to become awakened, we have to generate the, uh, the altruistic wish to awaken for the benefit of all beings. It has to be the bodhicitta, the bodhi mind, and the realizing of shunyata. Because when we move into the Mahayana, then it isn't just the eye the grasping that keeps us in samsara. It's the self-cherishing on the basis of that eye grasping that propels us, that keeps us from being able to become Buddha, becoming self, self-cherishing self blocks us. The root of samsara is the self-grasping, but the self-cherishing keeps us from generating the altruistic wish to becoming a bodhisattva, becoming Buddha. So then I want to give an example. One of the, my main teachings is I teach a, a very condensed, very powerful Tara uh, yoga retreat. And when it comes to the seven limb puja, instead, I added things to this sadhana. And I hope we all get to do it someday. We talked about this way at the beginning with Lozong. Oh, in, in March, maybe the center will open and I'm going to come there and give this retreat, which is wonderful because it includes meditating on emptiness, the dissolutions, all the aspects of highest yoga tantra are allowed, even if you're not fully fully um, initiated, which is, I wouldn't think of doing if it wasn't Lama giving that liberty. So anyway, instead of the seven limb puja, I put in the seven limb puja of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, that comes from a text called the Unit Unity of Avalokiteshvara and the Spiritual Master, which is actually Lama Yeshi taught this, he taught this in Australia. And I was just looking at Rabina's talk at your center. It was a couple of a month ago or something like that. And she was alluding to some of these things. I don't think if she was actually there at the time, but anyway, the, the, the text was taught. The unity of the spiritual master in Avalokiteshvara. Where this text come from is the people begged his holiness, who was 19 years old, 18, 19 years old. They begged him to write a sadhana about himself. As Avalokiteshvara and the Dalai Lama says, well, no way, I can't write a sign about myself. That would be just so arrogant. That would be so wrong, you know? And they said, please, please, please write a sign, write a sign. So he kind of acquiesced, you know? So, because he just did, thought it wasn't proper to write a sign about himself. So this is the words of a 19-year-old boy. And he wrote this seven limb prayer, which I love to use because not only is it poignant, but it's eloquent. And so then describing how to practice the Dharma. In the seven limb prayer, you have all the elements. As you probably heard from Bina many times, and you hear from me also, Sangye, the word Sangye means Buddha. Sangye, Shodang Soki Chonama. The word for Buddha in Tibetan is Sang which means the one who's completely purified all that needs to be purified and gay, one who's accumulated all the positive qualities, merit and purification. And so basically the seven limb prayer is the whole path. We should do this every day, no matter what your thing is. Usually it's in every sadhana, it's being included in your daily practice because it, can, it contains the complete path. So all of the things that are done should be done in emptiness, not just words. We always have to combine things with emptiness. So the first one is prostrating. So when we do a prostration or when we just even read about prostrations, everything should be done in the circle of the three. This was all taught by Lama Zopa Rinpoche in my very first course in 1974. You do everything. He taught how to do everything in the Samanta Bhadra way of expanding fundamental and you do everything by, with emptiness. So that means when you do a prostration, you do it in emptiness. So that means that the object of whom we're prostrating, us doing the prostrations and the action of prostrations are a dependent arising. It's called the circle of the three. So that means you don't just go, no, 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 I bow down, boo-doo. It means 
you do that in emptiness, everything goes deeper and more expanded by doing the practice. So the first two, it's more obvious in the first two parts of the seven limb puja, prostrating. Your liberating body is fully adorned with all the signs of a Buddha. Your melodious speech, complete with all 60 rhythms, flows without hesitation. Your vast profound mind filled with wisdom and compassion is beyond all conceptions. I prostrate to the wheel of these three, of these three secret adornments of your body, speech, and mind. This is the, the language of the Dalai Lama when he was so young. Offering the same. You don't just offer something. You offer in emptiness the object to whom you're offering. You and the action of the offering are all a dependent arising. The offering is a dependent arising, dependent on those three factors, basically. Material offerings of my own and others, the actual objects and those that I visualize. Body and wealth and all virtues amassed throughout the three times. I offer to you upon visualized oceans of clouds like Samantha Bhadra's offerings. Now, Samantha Bhadra. Samantha Bhadra taught us how to offer, how to expand. He, he's, the, oh, he's the original mind expansion guru. <laughs> Way back. He wrote the Avatamsaka Sutra. Probably it's considered the greatest Mahayana Sutra is the Avatamsaka Sutra, which he's the central character, central figure in this sutra. And the seven limb puja, the original seven limb puja. If you've all probably read the King of Prayers, the first seven limb prayer that we get into our, all our Tibetan schools, it comes from the seven limb prayers, which comes from the Samatha Bhadra from the seven limb prayer. That's Samantha Bhadra's seven limb prayer. I just included the one of the Dalai Lama. And so we offer according to Samantha Bhadra. So this also was the, when I first met Lama Zopa Rinpoche, the first course. It's funny, like Rabina, she was saying the other day, I was, I was a Lama disciple. I first met Lana was like a laser. I was Lana, Lana, Lama, just like Rabina. We, we're very good buddies, actually. It was 10 years before we kind of really Lama Zopa in our heart, you know, in the same way like Lama Zopa, like Lama Yeshi. Uh, but anyway, Lama Zopa taught all these things in my first course. I think I mentioned when I, I gave a talk not too long ago it, 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 to the Norbuling about what it was like at Kopan in the earlier days when Lama ran into the tent and said, what's so bad about attachment, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of blew our minds, blew my mind. That's, that's where I, I instantly connected with uh, Lama Yeshi. So anyway, also interestingly, the... I took this out of Lama Yeshi's book, uh, Becoming the Compassion Buddha, which is his commentary on the, on the union of, of Lokiteshvara and the spiritual master. And so Rinpoche would constantly teach Samantha Bhadra's way of offerings. And I've taught this to you. I think every Buddha I teach is so important. You can offer, you can do a virtuous action, the simple virtuous action of giving. This is why it's under the giving limb. You give, a, you give some food to a person who needs food. You give food to a beggar, a morsel of food to a beggar, which is a virtuous action, isn't it? It's no doubt, it's a good virtuous action. If you don't do it showing off, if you do it sincerely. So you can, you, can, you, can give a, you can give some food to a beggar or a needy person, and that's positive karma. But the Samantra Bhadra way of doing it is when you give food to the... To, the beggar or the person, you imagine in your mind that you're feeding the entire universe, you're feeding every being in the universe. So then that's the imprint that goes on the mind stream, the karmic imprint from giving this morsel of food, imagining that you're, it's incredible, imagining that you are feeding the entire universe. So you get, the, you get the merit of feeding the entire universe, you know, and that includes all the monks, nuns, everybody, everybody, everybody. Lama Zopa was practicing like this from the beginning. You know? So that's a Manta Bhadra's way. You expand everything you do. You always have a basis. You do it same when you do offer a mandala, you offer a million mandalas. It's vast. You fill the sky with mandalas, you fill the sky with offering. And, um, but that's the way to practice. So you practice an emptiness, which makes it very powerful. It makes it dharma. It makes us, that's either the path to, to free from samsara. And you do it Samantha Bhadra's way and you expand everything. Since to become Sangye Buddha, 
the, the song to purify, we're doing the purifications, which are other limbs here, but the, the accumulation is, is, uh, would be prostrating, generosity, etc. Purification would be prostrating. So all of them are included in the seven limbs. So then there's confessing. My mind being oppressed by the stifling darkness of ignorance. I've done many wrongs against reason and vows. Whatever mistakes I've made in the past with a deep sense of regret, I pledge never to repeat them. And without reservation, I confess everything to you. Then rejoicing. From the depths of my heart, I rejoice in the enlightening deeds of the sublime masters. And in the virtuous actions, past, present, future, performed by myself and all others as well, and by ordinary and exalted beings of the three sacred traditions. So not only are we doing that in emptiness, rejoicing is another way of expanding. We can rejoice in the deeds of the Dalai Lama and we get we enter into the path of the Dalai Lama. We, we get the, we get half, they say we get half the merit. I don't know if that's literal or not. So imagine, let's get on a, let's get on a sled behind his holiness and get, get half of his merit when we do things. It's, 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 it's another one of these mind-blowing things that Rinpoche just flips out about. He goes, merit. When he first heard how many microfiche mantras you could put in a giant prayer roll, he went, wow, think of the merit, think of the merit. You can't, you can't put in a hard drive. That doesn't count. Digital doesn't count. It has to be actually some form to it. So all these ways of making merit, making merit. I don't even like the word merit, but spiritual accumulation, whatever. Rejoicing. Requesting. This is just amazing. This is written by the Dalai Lama when he's 19. I request you to awaken every living being from the sleep of ordinary and instinctive defilements with the divine music of the Dharma's pure truth, resounding with the melody of profoundness and peace, and in accordance with the dispositions of your various disciples. Because what we're doing, you know, if we, if, if we practice ahimsa, non-harming, we're guaranteed a, a human rebirth. If we don't harm beings, we get a human rebirth. But a human rebirth is not good enough. There's some pretty crappy human rebirths on this planet. So then you have then you have a rebirth, a human rebirth, and then the generosity gives you all of the good things that can come with a human rebirth, everything you need, you know, all of your needs. In fact, the precious human rebirth in Tibetan is daljor. It means leisure and endowments. Leisure and endowments. Free time to practice and all the things you need to practice. But there's one other factor, isn't there? That's we want to meet with the teacher in the next life. That's besides being born human with everything we need, we want to meet the master again. In fact, we want to meet him right away, him or her. I consider now Kandala my guru as much as anybody. I, well, I'm happy to meet her. <laughs> I, whoa, she's got, the go she's got the goods completely, this woman. I've had a fortunate, yeah, it's been good experiences with him. Mama Zoba just, I worships her, you know, which is, to, she's deserving of it. So you, you, in accordance with the dispositions of your various disciples, you don't just pray to meet the guru. You pray to meet a guru that you can communicate with. Lama Yeshi was always about communication. He says, guru is communication. Initiation is communication. All these different things. He'd say it's communication. It's about communicating. And when he would teach, he'd go, we his English wasn't really very good, but he used it in a way. She used a few words and he communicated fantastically. And he'd always be going, are we communicating? Communicating or where? He'd come up with these examples. Are we communicating? So to meet a guru with whom we communicate, you can you could meet the highest Buddhist guru in the, in the universe, in the planet, and you might not communicate with him. I don't know about you, but I've met some gurus that are unconceivably real inconceivably realized, but they didn't really connect culturally, you know, whatever, it didn't, it didn't touch nothing, not because they're inferior, but Lama Yeshi's main characteristic that made him such a mind-blowing Lama for me is he communicated like a Buddha. He would teach, with Lozong, he would teach something, he would teach me something else, slightly different according to your mental, your mental proclivities or whatever, according to our dispositions. 
amazingly important. So we want to be born. So all this practice is to is we get born, we get born human, we get born human with everything we need, and we also want to meet the guru. I always give a good example of this. Uh, maybe the most powerful guru I ever met was Kabji Song Rinpoche, the great Kabji Song Rinpoche. I mean, he was so enlightening, so powerful, unbelievable. You know? but, but when he first went to, I think I've told the story to you before, I tell a lot. When he first went to America, he was like, he never had anything to do with Westerners, never. So he's go, they're going there in Wisconsin and they're just going to Sikishi Zopa. And they're going by and there's some people playing tennis. They're about, they're going bang, 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 playing tennis in their spare time. And, and Kevji Song Rinpoche, this old baby, old woman, what are they doing? What are those people doing? And it was explained by the translator and he says, Dharma does not flourish in this country. <laughs> you know, I'm a practitioner like that. Why would you waste time playing tennis when you can be practicing Dharma? But see, that's from lack of understanding the culture. Lama Yeshi understood his holiness understands, you know, that we can't all do it like that. We need also the communication. We need to be, yeah. Anyway, so there was a Lama who was the most incredible I ever met. And even at Song Rinpoche, he was giving a teaching in Spain and I attended that years after this. And, and he realized, he says, you know, I'm the stupid one in the room. Here's this being on me. And he's, because I don't understand your culture. And he says, the translator, he pointed to the translator, he understands your culture, so he's half stupid. But you are the people who understand. And so he almost apologized. He got it that <laughs> communication was so critical. You know, so you don't, you don't just pick the one anyway. So it's it's... We'll continue. We're, we're kind of blazing through these things. So then entreating, I entreat you to firmly establish your feet upon the indestructible Raja throne in the indissoluble state of Ivam until every sentient being gains the calm breath of joy in the state of final realization upon the ex unfettered by the extremes of worldliness or tranquil liberation. Pretty together, kid at 19, huh? <laughs> the way he writes this. I, de I totally dedicate my virtuous actions of all the three times so that I may receive continuous care from a master and attain full enlightenment for the benefit of all through accomplishing my prayers, the supreme deed of Samantha Bandra. So that's the seven limb prayer, which contains the whole path. It contains the, the things for purifying, it's for, for things of accumulating merit and for wishing to get the guru. The whole path is contained. Well, that's why it's a real good thing to do every day. Usually, if you have a sadhana that you do every day, it's included in the sadhana, the seven day prayer. Very important. And if you go to Sunni Lapta, one of these places where they don't do sadhana so much, every morning they chant the, uh, the chanting they do includes the uh, seven day prayer directly from Samantha Bhadra, Bodhisattva. So I have to be conscious of time here. 847, nine. So we got to nine, ten. Okay. So, trying to think of other things connected with sutra, samatha bhadra, these different ways. So anyway, in some ways, if we move to the lam rim, this extremely abbreviated lam rim, after the middle scope comes the higher scope. This isn't the lam rim, this is the... So anyway, so basically the middle scope, and this text goes through them blazingly quick. If it was the full on rim, it would take volumes to go through the first two scopes. So then it moves immediately into the middle scope. Training to attain liberation, not just uh, Oh, okay, training the mind on the path of the superior person, generating bodhicitta, generating com compassion, the foundation of the Mahayana. Thinking that all tormented beings are my mothers who have cared for me kindly again and again. Let me develop unfeigned compassion like a fond mother for her dear child. Inspire me thus. Be 
because this is, you probably done this, this prayer comes in the Lama Chopa. You probably do the Lama Chopa there, yeah? At Norbaling. So as you know, you have the Lam Rim prayer at the, at, the, at the last. This one, I used this translation because it's a, this was by Martin Wilson. It's a great copy translation of the Tibetan. So at the end of every verse, he says, inspire me thus. Because you know when you're doing the Lama Chopa, like any sadhana, it's a tantric sadhana. When you do the Lama Chopa at the beginning, you create the, the refuge field, isn't it? You create the, the, the field to which you're doing all of the practice, the guru. And in Lama Chopa, it's Lama Lozang Tubang Dorji Chang. It's your guru, Lama, Lozang, Lozang Chagpa, united with Tsongkhapa, Lozang, Lama Lozang Tubang, Tubang, the Buddha, and Dorji Chang. That's, that's, that's your, your field. And it remains above the crown of your head, like with any sadhana. We'll talk a little bit about sadhana when we get to the tantric part, but the Lama Chopa is a tantric text. And, um, so at the end of all these verses, you have inspire me thus, bless me thus, jingi lob, jingi lob. So that means as you go through all, it's another way of expanding and deepening your practice. Every practice that you do, you keep this above the crown of your head. And now in the case of the Tara, you keep the Tara on your crown, united with the Guru again. And so you ask blessings at the end of every verse to remove all obstacles to bless me to realize this verse. Every verse that I'm reading, it says, inspire me less, bless me thus, bless me thus. So not only you contemplate the verse and then you say, bless me to get the meaning of this verse. It all increases our possibility of getting the meaning of the verse by having the guru bless us. Each time we do the verse, very skillful. And in every sadhana, it's the same way. The Lama Chopa is just a sadhana. And this is the Lama Rim that comes at the end. And it's very abbreviated. <clears throat> so anyway, quickly going through the uh, <laughs> the beginnings of the uh, highest school, the Mahayana, before we get to Tantra. As no one desires the slightest suffering, nor ever has enough of happiness, there's no difference between myself and others. So let me be glad when they're happy, inspire me thus. There's two ways of, there's two ways of generating bodhicitta, aren't there? There's the exchanging self for others. I think I might've explained all these when I taught the weekend. The chronic, the, there's two methods, exchanging self for others, which is the most profound, and then there's seven paths, one result, which is seeing all beings as your mother, remembering the kindness, repaying the kindness, etc. As no one desires the slightest, oh, this chronic disease of cherish oneself is the cause of unwanted suffering. See this, let me lay blame on it and begrudge it and destroy the demon of self-grasping, inspire me thus. Lama Zopa uses this language all the time as well, the demon, the demon of the self-cherishing. What is, that's what keeps us from getting enlightened. Self-grasping keeps us in samsara and self-cherishing keeps us from getting fully awakened because we're always thinking about ourselves, me, 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 me. <clears throat> And contemplating the, adva the advantage of cherishing others. <clears throat> to cherish one's mother and to seek to place them in bliss is the gateway to endless virtues. Let me see this and though these beings may rise up as my foes, hold them dearer than my life, inspire me thus. And then exchanging the attitude of, of self-cherishing and cherishing others. In short, the, ch the childish work only for their own gain. The Buddha is only for others. With understanding how the faults and virtues here differ, may I be able to exchange self with others. Inspire me thus. To cherish oneself is the door to every downfall. To cherish one's mothers is the basis for everything good. So let me make the heart of my practice the yoga of exchanging self and others. Inspire me thus. And then the next verse is Tanglen, isn't it? The, the kind of the pinnacle of the Mahayana Lojong teachings. Therefore, worshipful and compassionate gurus, 
Let all karmic obscurations and suffering of mother migrators ripen on me now. And let me give others my happiness and good deeds so all sentient beings have happiness. Yeah, the pinnacle, the way to practice. I think every time, every time I've taught, I, I teach the, uh, the level of Tantra, I bring in the Kusum Lam care, the dissolution, the dissolution to the clear light. And talking about Sutra, it's always Tonglin. And I, you might have heard this story because of almost every time I teach, I get this story because there's very few things that we get a taste of. I got a taste of Tonglin and I got a taste of the other from, from Tantra of, of doing this dissolution. It's otherwise, I found that not much happening. So I always come to this one with Tonglin. I first got it with Tonglin. I did courses at Kopan, 74, 75, 76 with Lama Sokhara but it was almost all Lama Sokhara And then the ninth course later. When I did my first course, Lama Sokhara Rinpoche taught Tong Lin. And the way, because he, he was teaching hell, he, was, he, taught, he taught for the first three weeks of the course. I remember brand new, we haven't met the Dharma before, but somehow I, we had Dharma roots so we wouldn't have been able to stand it. Like Rabina was saying the same thing I was watching her last night, whatever other course. She's not much would have left if it would have been Lama Zopa before me, Lama Yeshi, because too much, you know. And so anyway, Lama Zopa Rinpoche was teaching about the hell realms and about uh, Tisha, came from Tibet, and then he was a prince that, from a school. He had a palace with 100,000 swimming pools and he was teaching us the eight worldly dharmas, eight worldly dharmas, eight worldly dharmas, which is important that we understand. What's dharma? What are worldly dharmas? So anyway, and then he taught Tong Lin. And as you know, when you do Tong Lin, you visualize like a lump of coal at your heart. This is the self-cherishing. This is the self-cherishing mind. And then you take on the suffering of others and you give it to the self-cherishing mind and completely disintegrate the self-cherishing mind. <clears throat> so anyway, when Rinpoche was teaching, he says, first we take on all the suffering of all the beings in the hell realms. He'd been teaching the hell realms for weeks. All of these horrors of the hell realms. And the hell I, be I believe in the hell realms. I never had any problem with believing in the hell realms. But I couldn't relate to it. I couldn't relate to that kind of suffering. You know, it was like, yeah, right. Take on all of these horrible things that torture and all the different examples, endless fire, endless torture and being woken up again, et cetera, et cetera. So I appreciated the practice and I tried to do it. I did it a bit, you know, but it didn't really click. And then he'd say, take on all the suffering of all the beings and the ghost realms. And then again, I believe in ghost realms and breathe them all in in the form of black smoke and the, all the poisons and breathe it in and give it to the self-cherishing mind and explode, completely destroy into a smithereens the self-cherishing mind. And then all the suffering of all the animal realms with graphic descriptions, he would give graphic descriptions of a worm being eaten by ants and things like that. Wow. You know. And so, and then of course the sufferings of the higher realms which is more difficult. So anyway, I never got it with Tong Lin. And, I, and when Lama Zopa, meanwhile, Rinpoche later, he, he was teaching about pray, pray for problems, pray for problems. Rinpoche was always teaching, pray for more problems. And I go, Rinpoche, you know, okay, maybe you pray for problems. I, 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 I want to remove my problems, but to pray for problems, I'm not really at that level yet to pray for problems. And I didn't really get it. I was just kind of ignorant of what he was teaching. And then the most profound thing that happened, one of the most profound things that ever happened to me, and I've probably told you this story, probably in both teachings, if I, that's when I teach, because it's one where I got it, the Tonglin. So I was left by the person I was with, I was married to, she left, and she actually came back. But anyway, this was, I was my first relationship, of course, it was first marriage, it was, I'd never even had a living relationship, she left, you know. And to go off and practice with her Hindu friends or whatever, anyway, she left. And so, and this was devastating. I was completely dis disturbed. 
I was disturbed by this unbelievable. And you know, when you're disturbed by something, even if you clear the mental thing from your mind, you have the loom, you have the winds, because with every emotion, besides the thought, there's the, the energies, the, the, the winds are disturbed. When you're angry, when you're attached, all of these delusions arise. It's not just the mental in the head, so to speak, but your winds are disturbed. When you get angry, your, 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 your winds are just a mess. So I was going, hey, Jimmy, you're a Dharma practitioner. What are you doing? You know, it's 15 years of monk practicing. Don't, don't, come on. They went to Laudo, did retreats, did Nundros. Come on, you can handle this one. <laughs> Being a crybaby. So, but I couldn't clear the stuff. I tried everything, sitting and meditating, meditating on karma. It's my karma that this happened. You know, this all helps. It all helps a little bit. When you, when, you, when you engender the view of karma, you're no longer a victim. Well, this happened to me because I created the cause at some time. It's time to start purifying the cause or whatever I did for this. And because um, in past lives. So anyway, I tried these things and they didn't quite work, you know, because I, I couldn't really calm my mind enough to focus on the practice because I was so disturbed by this story that was circulating in my winds as, as well as in my head, even if I cleared it from my head. So anyway, I was in the bazaar, Katwali Bazaar in Dharamsala, and I was having an anxiety attack over this. I was a real mess. And then I thought, think of all the beings. Think of others for a change. Think of all the beings that are going through what I'm going through. I mean, everybody. <laughs> it's, like, it's not my story. I mean, you talk to any person, they have their story of separation. When the Buddha taught that, when Buddha taught, he taught the first eight sufferings in humans, birth, old age, sickness, death, separation from what you desire is the fifth, isn't it? It's almost worse than death, separated from what you desire. Because being separated from what you desire is the theme of almost every poem, every song, every opera. My baby left me. Ah, it's the one that goes on and on and on. Lama Yeshi would say, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Himalayan mountain monk and people come to me with their problems. 95% of the time it's relationship problems. I don't know. I have never had a relationship. So I better understand how all this works. So anyway, I did that. I thought, well, I, I, very, I could very easily imagine what every being in the universe who is going through it, rather than hell realms, who are going through what I was going through because I had a very clear, visceral feeling about what I was going through. And so I know they were going through the same thing. So I breathed in all the other brothers and sisters out there who are going through what I'm going through. And it, I turned, I turned, it was black light and I gave it to the self-cherishing and it actually worked. It actually works, this bread. <laughs> you give it, and you know, you don't have to visualize a lump of coal. And when you have a broken heart, you're going around with a lump in your heart. It's already there. Me. And it's all about self cherishing, isn't it? The main suffering is poor me. I'm suffering. I was left. Ah, ah, ah. It's the self cherishing mind that's the problem. There's still problems that, you know, but that's the main one that causes us suffering, the self cherishing mind, that the actual event. <clears throat> and so, and I did it again and again, and it worked. So it was so easy to imagine this, all the shit I'm feeling. And I imagine all these brothers and sisters in the universe are feeling the same thing. And so I breathed it in. I might as well take on theirs and give it to the problem. And this was the problem, and it works. And when you dissolve the self-cherishing mind, what's underneath that? <clears throat> the clear light mind, isn't it? Whether we recognize it or not. Underneath the self-cherishing mind and the eye grasping is clarity, okay? So at that point is a perfect point to go to Tantra, the Tantra side of this talk, you know? Because let's go into the meaning of the word Tantra, the different words for, for Tantra. Tantra, Gu in Tibetan is means it's like a thread, it's like a continuum. Like when they talk about the Uttara Tantra, they talk about the divine continuum. It's the continuum. And what is the continuum? The continuum is that is our clear light mind. 
every one of us, even the worst person in the world, the worst beings in the planet, all the animals, everybody has at the basis of consciousness, clear light mind, purity. The fundamental mind of clarity, the fundamental mind of clear light, we all have it. So you get a glimpse of it, as well as all the other good things that you have. So you dissolve this, you imagine dissolving this, and so then you send out light. And when you first do the Tong Lim practice, you think, it's not very practical to take on all the suffering. It's kind of weird, you know, it's like almost nothing. And then you think, well, I'll use up all my goodness. And you think you don't have enough goodness, you don't want to send out light to all beings. But you, but you realize not only you have the capacity, little by little, you learn to take on unlimited suffering from others. And the more you do that, it's axiomatic that you have unlimited light to give back to others because under that self-cherishing, there's no limit to, to, to the, the, the clear light mind and all of the goodness we have, all of the good things. So the practice works. So Tantra itself is based on that, you, Tantra. The first thing that Lama taught, I think I might have it from here, and it's an introduction to Tantra. And this is just from my notes at some point. Stains are occasional. This was, I put in my Four Noble Truths teaching when we got to the third truth. Of, Stains are occasional, not mixed with the fundamental purity, the negative qualities, which don't have a valid foundation. We can balance our minds with anecdotes. This is what I wrote, actually. Awareness. We can totally purify our minds with wisdom, positive qualities. Positive qualities can be limitlessly developed and we can transcend all bonds and limitations. In meditation, we can identify the conventional nature of our mind, which is covered by our own conception. The conventional nature of our mind is the pure light. The ultimate nature of mind is emptiness and they become one in some way, if you can put that together. The nature of our mind, which covers our, which is covered by our conceptions. First stop past and future nam talk, conceptual thinking. And let mind flow in its own nature. Use inner wisdom confidence. And then this is the quote from Lama Yeshi. It's the first maybe thing that he taught in the introduction to Tantra. Lama Yeshi, no matter how confused or deluded we may be, the understanding and essential nature of our being is clear and pure. Like clouds in the sky don't damage the light-giving power of the sun. And the ultimate purpose of all spiritual practices, whether they are called Buddhist or not, is to uncover and make contact with this essentially pure nature. When we have developed our own inner purity, compassion and love, we can see their reflection in others. But if we've not contacted these qualities within ourselves, we will see ugly and limited. For whatever we see every day is actually nothing more than a projection of our own inner reality. So, and, and then according to Dharma, the ultimate goal of individual human elevation is enlightenment because we have purity. Our ultimate goal is to realize that. And like he says, it doesn't matter what religion you are. It's, of course it does. You know, we practice Dharma. We want to, we want to meditate on emptiness when we, the emptiness of this clear light mind, but getting a taste of it. And we get a taste of it sometimes. Sometimes things stop. It's only just watching a sunset or something. We really let go for a minute of the iron net of conceptuality. In the Dzogchen text, in the Mahamudra text, they always say we, we have to be free of the iron net of conceptuality, which keeps us in a bad place. This does not mean we deny conceptuality. Some people become fanatics. I did a three-month in insight course, for Pashna course, so-called, in Barrie, Massachusetts. And these people thought all of Buddhism was just a lot of nonsense. It was just doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, and just concepts, just thoughts. No, that's not correct because we have to use conceptuality. We have to have con con correct conceptuality. Bob Thurman, he would criticize this. He's so funny. He says, people think that Buddhists don't think. Even I Buddhists don't think, you know? You know? 
The Buddha taught for 45 years. He taught all these mass sutras, and it's all conceptual. He taught, you know, the Buddha can't think, you know, and he used to just, he would kind of poo poo people if they would just kind of suppress thinking, no. When you meditate, you should never depress the delusions. You should just observe them. And we don't suppress thinking. We don't get to this pure light mind because it just causes problems. So anyway, Bob Thurman made a joke about it. He says, yeah, I mean, the Buddha don't think he taught for 45 years. What do you think of this thing on his top of his head is? He says, extra scoop of brains. <laughs> it's Bob Thurman. That Buddha had an extra scoop of brains up there, you know. Oh, he's so funny. Anyway, um, So, but nevertheless, so the, the, the just in the names for the tantra, you, we get the meaning, and then we have the main. The main main for tantra is mantrayana, secret mantrayana, the mantra vehicle, mantra vehicle. And what does mantra mean? Man is manas mind, and tra is 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 to overcome ordinary appearance. So the tantras are about taking the mind and overcoming ordinary appearance with that mind. We're transforming things. So the mantrayana, manas mind. So what is it to transform ordinary appearance? It means to transform ordinary thinking, doesn't it? You know, it's from our thoughts come all this appearance. We're judging and projecting everything. So, by this is why when you say a mantra, you're actually replacing thinking. Blah blah blah. He did. She did. She is good. Bad. Good. Bad. Good. Bad. Like Lama was taking. You're replacing the normal thought process with mantra instead of blah 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 blah. You replace that with mantra. So you cut ordinary appearance. You cut ordinary thinking. Instead of thinking he did, she did, this bad, I'm bad, I'm good, blah, blah. You replace it with mantra. That's why you get these old amalas like Lama Sopa Rinpoche's mother. I mean, they would just say mantras all the time and they get more realized than just about anybody. And they think, well, they're not educated. They haven't studied Madhyamaka philosophy, but they just don't let their mind get full of garbage. Instead of thinking garbage, which is what we're thinking about most of the time, I should speak for myself anyway. You replace it with mantra and get a, and take a break. And that's cutting through the iron net of conceptuality right there. So mantra means that cutting off or stopping ordinary appearance, which means stopping ordinary thinking. So that's the tantra. The mantra yana, the vehicle of the mantra. And then Another name is the Vajrayana. Vajra means the diamond, indestructible vehicle. The indestructible vehicle. So what does that mean? Rami Yeshi, his way of teaching was first we do Lamrim, 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 and then he gave Vajrasattva. He gave Haruka Vajrasattva, not just Vajrasattva. And so it was so important to do Vajrasattva. There's a lot of preliminary practices. There's about seven of them in the Kargi. There's a, five of them. I completed the ones in the Kargi, but there's a few others. But the main one is Vajrasattva. And so we think of, we think of Vajrasattva as being a, something, a purification practice, don't we? We, we? we visualize in our crown Vajrasattva and there are the white lights coming and purifying. We, we feel ourselves at the level of our subtle body. We, we purify the subtle body. The white light comes down and we expel all the darkness out of the or other orifices. And so, but the, but, but the real meaning of Vajrasattva, the deeper meaning of Vajrasattva, Vajrasattva is indestructible being. So the real meaning of Vajrasattva, it doesn't mean that that isn't Vajrasattva, but the deeper one, and finally, it's the beginning, middle, and end of the path is Vajrasattva. It's the union of our subtle consciousness in our heart. We have gross consciousness and subtle consciousness and subtlest consciousness at our heart. 
It's the union of the deity, the Yidam, Saitara, and the Guru, and our subtlest, our subtlest consciousness. The union of those is Vajrasattva, the indestructible union. Bam. So, when you do a practice of a deity practice, deity is a bad translation. The real translation is yidam. Yi is another one of these words for mind, yidam. It means mind seal. <clears throat> so, um, so, in that sense, it's the same in a way as the mantra, manas, to protect the mind from ordinary appearance. And so we, we seal the mind from ordinary appearance by practicing the deity, practicing Tara, for example. And we identify with Tara. We think I am Tara. We identify with Tara instead of I am Jimmy. And we practice that. And this is also extremely profound. And so when you take an initiation of highest yoga tantra, say it's the Chidamani Tara, there's a part in the initiation where, the, where we use the Dalai Lama, the Dalai, the Dalai Lama is the guru, and Tara is the deity, the Yidam. The Dalai Lama is completely unified with Tara. Now he can be unified with Tara anyway, but nevertheless, the Dalai Lama goes in like all Lamas, they go in and they do self-initiation. Before he'll do the give the initiation, he does self-initiation. He does the whole initiation practice to oneself. And we can do this, this, this we'll talk about this. We can also do self-initiation. Once you do the retreat and all of the mantras, the fire puja, we can do self-initiation, which is the most powerful purification practice one can do. That's something to look forward to if you're not already doing it. But you have to complete the retreat of highest yoga tantra. So during the initiation, the Dalai Lama is on the throne and he's union with Tara. And at one point, you come up to him individually, or he or they go around with a bumpa, za hum bam ho. You absorb the guru, Dalai Lama, subtle mind of the Dalai Lama, Tara and you bring it down the central channel to your heart chakra. That's where you bring it down. That's Vajrasattva, boom. So the real taking of an initiation is the union of those three, the unified Vajra state, the indestructible indivisibility of the guru, the yidam, and your own subtle consciousness. And every sadhana that you do is the same. You generate the, you generate the deity, say Tara, we use Tara, and we bring it back down to the heart. <clears throat> so uh, let me make sure I'm looking for time. Yeah, we still got time. We're gonna have to do blood blaze away here. But anyway, so tantra is that. And so another distinguishing characteristic between sutra and tantra, tantra is dealing with subtle consciousness, sutra is dealing with gross consciousness, it's dealing with the five sense consciousness, it's dealing with uh, mind, mental factors, etc. But Tantra, you're dealing with subtle consciousness. The channels, the winds, the drops, the subtle body, the prana, the loom, the winds that flow through the subtle body, through all these channels, drops, etc. The chakras are centers. They have many channels. Basically, our subtle body gets divided into 72,000 channels and all of, the, all of the winds go through those channels. The winds is called loom in Tibetan. <clears throat> In China, in, it's in, in Sanskrit, it's prana. It's the prana that's going through our body. We're doing pranayama, purifying pranayama. And in Chinese, it's chi, like tai chi. It's the same thing, pranayama, lum. And aikido, ki. So we're working with that. At the level of subtle body, we have a subtle mind and subtle wind. And they're inseparable. Wherever the subtle wind blows, the lum goes, the mind goes. So you're working it in both ends. You're not just purifying the mind, you're purifying the wind and they're inseparable. So this is the profound action of Tantra and there's all these sadhanas we do, etc. This is quite a lab, but we can look forward to them. So anyway, um, and then one of the other amazing things about Yoga Tantra is
you meditate on emptiness when you do a sadhana, say you do a tar sadhana, or you do your lama chopa for that matter. What happens at the beginning of the practice? At the beginning of the practice, you generate the uh, the lama lozan tuba and doji chong in your crown. If you're doing the tar practice, above the crown of your my head is tara. <clears throat> And we generate the visualization, imagination, the better word that Lao Tama used to do is Tara on our crown. And then what happens? Then light goes out from the tongue, the seed syllable in Tara, and invites all the enlightened beings of the 10 directions and the three times to absorb into this Tara. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the enlightened Bodhisattvas tend to absorb into this. So then for the rest of the practice, we have above the crown of my head is our guru, the subtle body of the Dalai Lama, and we, and we have Tara and all the enlightened beings. And that's there for the whole practice. And this is called the, the Samaya being. This is the one we receive in the initiation and we visualize, we imagine. So we imagine we're, we're empowered to visualize, above, imagine above the crown of our heads, Tara, in union with uh, the, day, the, the Guru, Dalai Lama in this case. And then uh, all the other beings are invited and they come down and they, they enter in. And that way, they, at that point, they even initiate the Tara on our crown. They give the initiation. So the Damsigpa or the Samaya being, the commitment being, is the being that we imagine, and we got that in the initiation. And the wisdom being is the one that, that comes, to the, all the enlightened energy that comes down from all of the pure lands, etc., and absorbs into that. So that's what's above the crown of our head. There, what we have happening there is extremely profound. The one that we visualize becomes empowered. So it becomes the actual Tara, actual Dalai Lama, subtle mind, etc. But we still imagine it. And then we do all the rest of the practice, same like with, same like I gave the example of the seven minute prayer. You do that all in relationship to the merit field, don't you? You did if you did the Doji Parjasava, you do the whole practice. It's always above the crown of your head. You're doing all these practices, all the offerings, the different kinds of offerings, the mandala offerings. You're constantly taking the blessings down. When you do the long rim prayer, you're praying to make, realize each one and take the blessings from this is happening on our crown. And then at the end of the practice, whether it's Tara, Haruka, Vajyogini, et cetera, what do we do? We absorb. We absorb Guru Tara back down to the heart. And so we've meditated on emptiness. Tara isn't self-existent, but we visualized her. <laughs> so, so we visualized Tara. So we know since we created, it's called creation states. The creation, there's two stages to yoga tantra. There's creation states, kerim, k, creation, birth state. And there's sogrim, sog is the completion. And so we have imagined, so k, we have imagined the deity, and it's not just an imagination, it's one that's given to us in the initiation. It's got some power to it. It's got some connection. Um, and we bring it back down. And so actually, we meditated on the emptiness of Tara. Because Tara is empty, Buddha is empty. We know it's dependent and rising and emptiness are the same, aren't they? Because it's a dependent and rising. We know she and our crown is 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 a dependent arising because we visualize there is dependent on us visualizing and then it's dependent on all the other parts that came together and entered into it and at the end it comes down to our heart vajrasattva is indestructible whether it's tara what practice it is so in fact any highest yoga tantra sadhana always has vajrasattva at the beginning because before you invite before you invite the Buddha and all the enlightened beings and your guru to come down and enter your subtle body, you purify it. You do 21 Vajrasattvas before. You clean the subtle body before you invite it. In this Tara Sadhana, since it's only based that I'm giving, it's only based on the Guru Yoga, I did a I added in that we do the first recitation of the mantra. We do the white light coming down, which is the same as Vajrasattva, before we absorb. 
because it's traditional. You make sure that you think I'm in your imagination. You're completely clean, clear, pure before you bring it down to your heart. So in a nutshell, that's a sadhana. And uh, in a nutshell, we meditated on emptiness. And, and there's another thing that's very important because we impute I, we label I to, our, to ourselves, isn't it? To the five skandhas. The five skandhas, the Buddha divided this into five skandhas, form, feelings, perceptions, karma formations. And um, the five is, is, is who we are, is what we are. And in the Heart Sutra, it says they're all empty. Each one they go through, this is empty. Form is emptiness, form, da, 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 da. So we label I to, to this body-mind complex, don't we? So in that sense, the I that we label to the body-mind complex is actually, we're just doing it. We're, 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 we're just merely labeling. We, 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 we label I or Jimmy, and then we build this up. There is no such thing. There's a, there's the body and the mind. That's it. <laughs> Buddha called his, he's, he's, he calls it anatma, no atman, because the Hindu religion at the time said there's a body and a mind, but there's also a pure I, there's a pure, pure atman, which is permanent, partless, and independent, which means it can't exist according to Buddhist philosophy. It never existed. Yet we label I or Jimmy to this body-mind complex and we believe in it so concretely. So it's a wrong view, isn't it? It's wrong. We're labeling this, this I to this body-mind complex and saying that it ultimately exists and we believe in it and we defend it. So then when you do the Tantra, you're actually, <laughs> you're labeling yourself as Tara to the, to the five skandhas, but we're labeling it to the subtle clear light mind at the basis of all the four consciousnesses, not the form. Because even a mind of anger has as its fundamental nature clear light. There's purity in every consciousness, even anger. So you're labeling Tara. So it's just as valid to call ourselves Tara as it is calling ourselves I. They're both ultimately kind of not reality. I, we're labeling to the skandhas and we're believing it. And Tara, we're labeling the skandhas. And Tara is actually a little bit higher because we're labeling Tara to our subtle body. And the Tara we've been had blessed through the initiation, etc. So we're identifying with Tara, the yi dam, yi mind dam. We're cutting through ordinary appearance. And so we start identifying with Tara, which still isn't ultimately true. It's still empty. Instead of Jimmy, instead of Carol or whatever our names are, and I'm delusion, I'm happy, I'm unhappy, I'm unworthy. So you cut through all, this is a great psychology that cuts through all this low self-image. You got a bad self-image, practice Tara. You're Tara. <laughs> you know, you have the best image you have of yourself imaginable. It's not completely false. It's something that you've labeled to your body according with the power of initiation, except that you identify with that. Identifying with Tara is not quite, it's still empty. It's a little bit it's not a separate self from the body of the mind. It's the same with, with doing the thing with Tara. But at least with Tara, you are labeling her, positing her to the, to the subtle mind in the skandhas, the mind skandhas. So all of this is extremely profound. It's Lama Yeshu said. So simple. It's so simple, isn't it? It is actually. But the meaning of it is so profound. That's Tantra. Just that identification can start to change us. Lama used to say, we need to have Tantra, you know, it's not good enough, the others. Because we have all this image problem, self-image problem, we need Vajrayana, we need it, we need it, we need it, you know. And, and even in, in, the, in, the, in the Tantric teachings, it says it's not enough to meditate on emptiness. You need the subtler mind of, you need the subtler mind before you actually get enlightened. Even though that's a long way off. But meanwhile, we can practice. And when you, and then at the end of the practice, the end of every practice is you do the dissolutions. It's called kusum lamkir. This is the highest yoga tantra practice. Kusum lamkir. The essence of the generation stage of highest yoga tantra, kirim, is the is the 
three kayas practice. Ku is body, sum is three, lam is path, like lam rim care, bringing the three bodies into the path, bringing the nirmanakaya, the sambhogakaya, the dharmapaya into the path. So at the end, you dissolve the deity. <laughs> you dissolve. So when we do this, when we do, I hope you can join the retreat sometime because we get away with in the retreat, even if you haven't had a highest yoga tantra initiation, we do these practices and I wouldn't do that without Lama kind of giving permission somehow, kind of secretly, you know. Lama gave these absorptions to beginners in the first Lama Rim courses. You know, the death, the death stages of death. If you looked at a Lama Rim birth, you go through the stages of death. That's what you're doing. The Kusum Lama care is, it happens perfectly when we die. When we die, we do just exactly as perfectly as Naropa, Pama, Sambhava, Tsongkhapa. We perfectly dissolve ourselves and we end up with a clear light mind. You practice yoga for years to get to where you can dissolve down to the clear light mind. When we do it in the sadhana, it's facsimile. But when we die, we're going to meet the clear light mind, but that's it. It's going to be the real one. So by practicing this constantly, Lama had us practice it when he do the death stages when we were doing beginners in Kopan. And he got criticized. He got criticized by the other big lineage Lamas. How can you give this a secret? How can you give it to these people? And Lama said, this is Lama Yeshi. Why keep a secret what happens to everybody when they die? <laughs> Why keep a secret? You should give it to everybody. They should be practicing this when you do a sadhana. Every time, multiple times, you practice for death. So when then when death comes, you do the dissolution. So I won't go through the, the... So at the end, like when we do our tar practice, I hope you would join me at some point. And the first thing that happens is we've, when we've said the first recitation of the mantra, we've purified ourselves. And then we've absorbed, we've absorbed down to our heart. We become oneness, inseparable. And then at our heart appears on a lotus and a moon disc, the syllable Tom. And as we do the second recitation, we send out five colored light and we transform the entire universe into the pure land of Tara. We transform everything into the pure land of Tara and we awaken all beings in the universe in the aspect of Tara. And so at the end of the practice, we absorb. We absorb the entire universe. We absorb everything external to ourselves and we go through the absorptions. First, when we absorb the entire universe into ourselves. When we do that, and this is what's happening when we die also, when the earth element becomes weaker and it's overpowered by the water element. So this creates a vision of a mirage. This is what happens when we die. We get a vision of a mirage. I won't go into all the other attendant things. Also, we, we feel like we're being crushed because there's no more earth element. This is the things you go through when you die. You get ready for it. You know, oh, no, I feel like I'm being crushed, but at the end of all, this is the clear light. With confidence, you know, you've been practicing it every day to die. So, yeah, tantra amazing. So then in the next part, you would absorb yourself all into the tom at the heart syllable. So there's nothing left but the tongue and the subtle letter below. And so as the water element becomes weaker when we're dying or doing the yogas, it's overpowered by the fire element and this produces a vision of smoke. And then the next one, the little achun, the syllable below, absorbs upwards into ourselves as the tongue. And as the fire element becomes diminished, it's overpowered by the wind or the air element and we have a vision of sparks. Sometimes they say fireflies. And then we absorb upwards and become smaller and smaller. Now it's every sign is different. One has Tom, one has Bam, one has whom. We absorb up to the top of that syllable and then we have a vision of a lamp, that's a little lamp, flame that's going out in the dark room as the air element, the final element absorbs. 
And at that point, and the medical, according to our, in, 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 we'd be medically dead. In the dying process, we'd be medically dead. There'd be no more heartbeat, no more EKG or whatever the middle one is, boom, boom. We'd be medically dead. And this is why you do not die in a hospital. Don't do it. Die, do these practices. Be left alone when you die. You don't want anybody to touch you because you're still in there. Even common people like us, especially if you've done these practices, you spend days. Until your body starts to rot, you don't leave. But meanwhile, you're in the clear light. You're in the clear light mind. So anyway, the next stage of that absorption would be you absorb into the crescent and there's only white appears. The next you'd absorb into the tigle, only red appears. And then finally, it is evolved into the nada and only black appears and then like a black curtain coming down. There's nothing left but the clear light mind. You practice, this isn't the real one. It's the one that you do in your sadhana. So you're left with the clear light mind. But when you die or when you do all the perfect, all these yogas, it's the real clear light. The whole basis, the part of our mind that's pure from the beginning, we become one with that. We're not enlightened yet, you know, but, we, but we become, we, we, we identify with our purity instead of, and we see it's empty, instead of identifying with the delusions that are on top, which we've been doing. So it's like that, that, Clear light mind is luminous, it's radiating, it's totally free from conceptuality. It's like a crystal mirror, which merely reflects everything that appears in it. So then you, you, you do that meditation. And then when you come out of the meditation, this is what we do, I hope you join someday. Then you see everything is just a reflection. Everything that appears to you, your friends, your house, everything you're doing, the Dharma Center, your car, you see, this is just a reflection in my mind, in the mirror of my mind. So there's nothing to grasp at. There's nothing to push away. It's meditation on emptiness. Lama gave this gift. It's meditation on emptiness. Without 16 years of study, you can do it. It actually works. It's not pure prasangika, he says, but it works. And then you can refine the pure prasangika later. But meanwhile, as you go through life, you can see everything that appears to you is a reflection in your mind. And so when, if it's something that you don't like or you like, you don't grasp it what you like, you don't push away what you don't like, and you're not indifferent to what, what, or everything else. So you've been given a method to practice all the time. And we forget to do it, but when one does it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And this is the gift of Lama Yeshi. If you want to hear this, you can go to your YouTube and you can go to Lama Yeshi, Introduction to Tantra, part two. Part one, he's just doing the Lama Rim, part two. In the context of the Chen Rezi practice, he talks about this dissolution and exactly what I've repeated just now. <clears throat> and so uh, that's something to look forward to. And then when you do highest yoga tantra retreat say for chitamani tara i remember doing that it was the first one that lama yeshi gave was chitamani tara i was lucky enough to be there in 79 when he gave that practice and then when i was sent up when i was first ordained he was sent up to Laudo to do that practice up in Laudo. uh yeah it was a peak experience and so the amazing teachings that lama gave he chose that to give us his first initiation <clears throat> and um But when you do uh, the retreat and you do the number of mantras, you do all these mantras, mantra, 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 mantra. you like, I think it's 600,000 for the Tara retreat. It's 100,000 for Vajrasattva. For Vajrayogini, it's 400,000 mantras. <clears throat> it's a little longer. It can, you can do that in two months, for example, for Vajrayogini, because that's the retreat I've done the most. It's my main daily practice. <clears throat> so at the end of the retreat, you do the required mantras. And then you do a fire puja where it's this elaborate puja where you have all these elements and grains and you throw, it's called jinsek. And you imagine throwing all the last, the last of your delusions into this fire. You offer them to the fire god, Mela, and you offer them to Dara. And then when you've done those two things, then you can do what's called self-initiation, danjuk. The very same initiation text that the Dalai Lama will give you when he does Yuvar Yogini or Ruka, whatever he's teaching, exactly that same practice you could do yourself. 
And you can follow it. You follow the text when the Dalai Lama is giving the initiation. But word for word, it's same. So you have the ability to do self-initiation, which is the most powerful practice you can do for purifying all of your negativities. Even if you really screwed up a lot, you can do that. It's the most powerful of all practices. Lama Yeshi on his deathbed, he was doing self-initiation of uh, Aruka, which was his main practice. Bajugini Aruka, same. Oh, we have gone way over. We've got nine minutes over. Am I cool for a five more minutes? How does that work with you people? Am I violating? Okay. So there's so many things I've gone too far to explain <laughs> the whole thing, you know, but anyway, it's worthwhile. You can get it more purely. At some point we can teach a course with details and talk. We need a lot of details. It's just to inspire one if one that does it or explain things, how it works. So, <clears throat> Lama Yeshi, and his lineage is coming from Aruka. Aruka is a generic name. It's Chakra Sambara in Sanskrit, the wheel of bliss, Chakra wheel, Sambara, or Kolo Dem Chog in Tibetan. And of the main Yidams, the main highest yoga tantra practices, it's the one that's mostly dealing with overcoming desire, removing attachment and desire. Yamantaka is more dealing with overcoming anger. And Guya Samaja is more uh, overcoming ignorance. Of course, with all of them, you overcome all three, but Aruka is specialized for that. And so I think uh, Rabina alluded to this. I don't think she was there, though. The Dharma, there was a thing called the Dharma celebration, the enlightened experience celebration that Lama Yeshi offered. Uh, in 1982, I was a monk then. I was a monk at Nalanda. We just moved to Nalanda to make Nalanda Monastery. And he organized this thing, amazing, most amazing thing you can imagine. All the greatest, greatest top lamas, Dalai Lama, Song Rinpoche, Serkong Rinpoche, Ling Rinpoche, da, 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 all the greatest, the gurus of the Dalai Lama, all of them to come and give their lineages. And even though if we're not qualified for them, Lama knew that these Lamas were going to die and he knew that he was going to die. So all these were given to his students. And back then there wasn't even, just to phone somebody was impossible. He said, call everybody up, tell them to quit their job. Come here now and do this, you know? This once in a lifetime thing. Was it Tushita, Kopan Tushita and Bogaya? But the main part was it Tushita. And Song Rinpoche was the longer that I mentioned you were like, what are, you, what are these people doing wasting their time? And so the Haruka, not just the Haruka practice, but he gave the Haruka body mandala, which is the most secret and most precious of all Tibetan practices. And uh, Lama begged him to give it three times. And he goes, there's no way I give that practice. He wouldn't even give it to some of his 20, 30 year Geshe students, you know? And Lama begged him. And so Song Rinpoche opens this teaching in the Tushita Gompa. There were about 200 of us there, monks and nuns. And the first thing he said is, I'm wasting my time giving you people this teaching because you can't turn mules into horses, you know, which is basically true, you know. But he says, but your, your Lama, Lama Yeshi begged me to give this teaching three times, so I have to give it. And so the imprint was there. A lot of us did the retreat. We didn't realize it. It was so advanced. We didn't realize it. And Lama came out to me on the porch of Tushita. And also at that, the Sangha, all the FPMT Sangha, the Sangha at the time, we did the Guya Samaja. There's three major Yidams, deities, the highest yoga tantra yidams, the Galem. The Guya Samaja for the ignorance, the Yamantaka for obstacles, anger, and Haruka. And so they're called the Song De Jigsum in Songwe Dupa. Yeah, it's an abbreviation of the names in Tibetan of those three. And so we were all doing a, a Shiguya Samaja retreat where it was just a five, a five page sadhana. We're just doing mantra, 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 just to complete the mantra. We weren't really doing it properly in a sense. Well, we were. Once you complete the mantra and do the sadhana, it was a short, short sadhana. 
we could do the fire puja and, and, and we would have completed it. And so in the Yamantaka, we did kind of the same when I was a monk in Atlanta. Um, and it was Selim Rinpoche who was Yamantaka who gave that lineage then at the time. And of course, Song Rinpoche is a Ruka, Trijan Rinpoche was a Ruka. And so Lama came up to me on the porch of uh, Tushita and he said, I'm having all of you monks and nuns do all three of these practices. I want you to complete them somehow so that I can offer to His Holiness the Dalai Lama that my Sangha has completed the Sangha Jigsum all three. That's why I'm doing it. But he says, frankly, it's about Haruka. <laughs> he said, it's about Haruka. He says, Aruka is about the purifying desire. He says, we live in the desire realm. This is what Lama was telling me. We live in the desire realm and we live in the desire age, the Kali Yuga, and, and your problem is desire. <laughs> For all of us, our problem is desire. You know, it's anger, isn't it? Mostly, I almost across the board. Our One of my favorite quotes from my precious friend, Rabina, she said, nobody ever gives up their vows so that they can go kill somebody. <laughs> and you get the idea, but they give up their vows so they can do something else to, to what their desire is someone. Very well put, you know. So our problem is desire. It's the biggie. And so anyway, that's the practice for that. And, and gradually, maybe that can overcome. He says, you need tantra so that you can cope with things as they appear. Like the thing that we just gave, you see everything is a reflection in your mind. You're walking down the sidewalk, you can see if you've got a problem with attachment. This is just a reflection in my mind. If, if, if the object of attachment appeared, by the time you did Chandra Kriti seven point analysis about this person doesn't really exist as beautiful, boom, 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 you've already lost your mouse. You know? But boom, this is just a reflection in your mind. Don't be fooled by this, you know? So it's immediately useful. And also Lama Yeshi taught one text, he taught a Chita Mantra text actually, because it was so meaty, it's so useful to see everything as the mind. Now that isn't ultimately true, it's refuted by the Prasangikas, but wow, it's very valuable. It's really useful to see things as your mind and take responsibility for it. So anyway, that's Sutra and Tantra and in a I'm sorry, I'm babbling on trying to put too much in, but if any seeds of it makes us want to learn more or practice more to get an initiation at some point. Also, one other thing that's important, when you do these retreats, you do all these mantras, right? Mantra, 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 thousands and thousands and thousands. And people get to think it's about mantra. How many mantras have I done? Da, 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 da. Actually, you do those mantras to complete the to complete the numbers, but the numbers aren't the thing, obviously. But if we didn't take that, we probably wouldn't do them. So we do, we take the, the text, the numbers. So when you're doing a retreat, I remember I got to a point where I wanted to just do a retreat and focus on the on the three kayas practice, the absorption. And so I went to this one yoga, one of the great. I think it was Kriti Sinchev Rinpoche, and he said, actually. The essence of the retreat is the meditation on the clear light at the end, and the mantra is just to settle your mind. So what you do, you do the you do the meditate on the clear light, or you try to meditate, it's facsimile clear light at that point. And when the mind starts going all over the place, you do mantra to replace all these thoughts with the mantra. And then you do mantra again, mantra, 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 mantra the mind gets quiet, and you go back to doing the absorption again. One to the other, one to the other. Instead of letting your mind go off in meditation about thinking she did, he did, I went, where am I going to go on my holiday? Where do I go after this? What are we going to get for lunch? You know, all the stuff we think about, it, you know, like that. So you, you, you replace that with mantra and then you go back to the mantra and then you, the essence is meditating. So I did a couple more times the Vajrayogini retreat and we just focused on that. You just do one full session a day and focus on those things. That's what Kurdi Sensei Rinpoche taught me. Any of this, if you ever get initiation, we get a chance to practice together. Anyway, uh, yeah, Paula Chichester, she she leads the Bardiogini retreat. She's very good at that because she did the actual retreat and also she did the Yamantaka retreat. You probably met her. And uh, 
But when we do the star retreat, we include those three kayas is even for people that are doing the great retreat with initiation. Because Lama kind of allowed it because it's very important to do it. It's good to get an initiation at some point, but sometimes that creates the cause for it. And if anybody criticizes you for doing that without being fully initiated, you say, why keep a secret from what happens to me when I die? Lama's answer to that. But better to get the initiation. And at that point, the difference between sutra and tantra, once you once you once you've brought the when you've taken initiation, that person's your guru. Dalai Lama is your guru for life. You bring down to your heart the yidam, you you receive the initiation. Often people, these are very elaborate, these initiations go on for hours. You know, call it chakra it goes on for days and so much detail and ritual. It's like you think, I didn't get this. So just keep in mind, if you have that experience and you attend to one of these initiations, if you think of the, the guru, the Dalai Lama, and if it's a tar initiation and tar are inseparable, when you bring them down to your heart, you receive the initiation, whether you knew all of the ritual and all the details or not, you can be confident that you got the initiation at some level without understanding all the details, which is very useful. People come out of an initiation, go, oh my God, what does this mean? We do all these, there's so many parts to it, but the essence of it is that, bringing the guru down to the heart. But then that person's your guru. And that's why you want to be careful. You don't want to take a highest yoga tantra initiation from someone who you're not sure about. No, you're taking a kind of a risk. And in fact, it was so strict in ancient times that it would, the, the guru would check out the disciple and the disciple the guru for 12 years before they would consent to that. But what's happened to that now? So we live in a degenerate age. It's not easy, is it? You know, Lama Yeshi tried to do that correctly. First, he waited five years before he gave the Bodhisattva vows. Then he waited years before he gave the highest yoga tantra initiation. Trungpa did the same, whatever you think of Trungpa. He, he, he said, we should just sit with our shit and do Vipassana for years. And then slowly gave Bodhisattva vows and initiation. But then later you can't do that because then people show up and they go, I want the initiation. And you don't know, in a past life, I know people that came in brand new and they went for an initiation and they, they connected. So it's hard to reject people. And it's kind of self-secret if they don't get it. It's like, because they don't, you know, they didn't really get the initiation. Um, so, yeah, you might try to think of do that, but it's, but it's, it's difficult. In modern times, especially in the well, back, I'm always saying in the good old days, in the good old days in Dharamsala, you could go see Sir Kang Rinpoche and you could say, I would like to have the highest yoga tantra initiation. Come tomorrow, bring a translator, not too many people. It was that easy. <laughs> and incredible. And now there's no way, there's nobody qualified to give them, and you have to wait for these big ones. The Kala Chakra is just, for me, it's over my head. It's just, there's 722 deities in the Kala Chakra mandala. I know, no way you can deal with that. Good old Varjogini, one head, two arms, you know. You just you do that <laughs> like that, you know. Same, same value, keeps it a little simpler. Lama Yeshi says I chose Tara because uh, I used to sit up in my room and watch everybody how they related to this beautiful Tara statue at Kopan. They had this natural connection rather than something like Yamantaka, which is wrathful and bleeding skulls around the neck and all that. Sometimes it's a little hard for people, even though it's all symbolic, it's meaningful. So he gave Tara as his first one. And he gave commentary to it and was fortunate to be there and continue to lead that. And we do, even though it was just, the, the, the FPMT sadhana is just basically the, the guru yoga from that Tara, this little booklet that I was reading the Seven Moon Prayer from. That was in any way. Uh, you've seen it, this one. And so just took it, written by, it's just taking from the highest yoga tantra tar, Chidamani, and making it's just taking the guru yoga of that one. And I added in the things to make it complete. I took the Dalai Lama's uh, seven and puja instead of an abbreviated one. And, and I added meditating since it doesn't have the Varjasattva. The first recitation, we have quite like coming down and purifying ourselves before we observe, absorb to make it a complete sadhana, and then at the end we do the absorption. So it's it's really nice to be able to do that. I still am doing it online with uh, some people, 
because His Holiness requested that sitar would be the best to overcome the difficulties of COVID. So we've been doing this little group's been doing it every Sunday and Wednesday. You're welcome to join if you want. I can send you a link. And if you can get a copy, I can send you a copy of this sadhana. I can send you what is it is. Anyway, uh, they can put up on the thing. Lozan can put it up or whatever. Jigme9, J-I-G-M-E-9 at gmail.com. If you ever want to communicate, ask more questions from the babbling on, we can continue with this. Because basically that's all I do is try to do this. I'm not giving full teachings. I don't have the opportunity. So it's, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to do this here. Extremely abbreviated practice, including Sutra and Tantra in one talk, but hopefully we can give them longer later. Maybe Lozan will invite back to do something longer or even do the retreat at some point as a New Mexico center. That would be really good. So any virtue we've accumulated through our reflecting on the Dharma, hearing the Dharma, questioning it, meditating on it, or even the effort we come to be here together, even that mere effort, we want that effort to ripen in the form of our awakening. If we direct it, we dedicate that, that effort and that whatever we've glimpse of light we may have gotten, not from Jimmy Neal, but from the Bama Yeshi and the people. I'm just passing on there. I don't know anything. So any, any light that comes, may that serve as a cause for our awakening. Because only when we are more awake will we be able to benefit beings. And only when we are more awake will we be able to more benefit beings more. <clears throat> By virtue of doing these practices, may I become Ayatara and lead every sentient being in her divine enlightened state. Or Shakyamuni, if you don't put Yoma there, you put Lama Sangye. And the other prayer is in English, May the bodhicitta, which has not arisen in my mind, may it arise, and may that which has arisen never decrease, but go on increasing more and more and more and more and more. Thank you, people, for your patience to put up with my babbling on and articulateness. I appreciate it. I hope we can continue in the future. I loved it. Thank you very much. Yeah, Everyone be well. Contact if you want to. Participate in Tara and get set aside or whatever you want, you know, like uh, continue. I'm happy to discuss things separately. I, I have a lot of bit of time on my hands. Now, this, these were years, it's only online teachings. And so I thank Norbert Ling for being, having to do a few.